Welcome to the Lynch Rentals Podcast. I'm Ryan Hill. This week, Roger and I are talking with Josh Velkersell and Nora Moran from NASA's photography team. Josh and Nora work primarily at the Johnson Space Center, and their work varies widely from portraits to astrophotography to hard science. We'll talk about their backgrounds, how they landed their dream jobs, the intersection of art and science, and how it feels to be recording history every day. Uh, Nora and Josh, thank you for joining us this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having us. Thank you for coming on. This is going to be the highlight of my week. I'm really, really excited for this interview. I, and I want to start by kind of getting a general idea of both of your job responsibilities. It kind of seems like you both wear a lot of hats. Can you describe your primary responsibilities, at least as far as NASA is concerned? Sure. I, I like to think of it, um, or I like to tell people it's kind of like uh, you can imagine a college campus photographer where there's a bunch of group shots, you know, science projects going on, portraits of staff, VIP tours, you know, special ceremonies and events. That's our day to day. And on top of that, there's astronaut training, uh, both on site and in the field, crew portraits, uh, spacesuit portraits, uh, space flight hardware documentation um, for use by the engineers and aerial photography of of all kinds of various sorts. So there are a lot of hats. It's a really dynamic job. Yeah. um, I will echo everything that Josh just said. I think that's a good description of what we do as photographers. Um, I will also add that myself, I'm uh, also working with the social media group. Um, So I do uh, some social media coverage for uh, the station, um, like Twitter and Facebook and those accounts as well as work on like the Houston, we have a podcast podcast. So, um, I wouldn't have pictured if you told me I'm talking to two NASA photographers, which seems like the greatest gig ever, but your backgrounds are actually more fascinating to me than where you are. Josh, you, you had my dream job. You worked for wired. Yeah. (laughs) I'm guessing that was fairly cool. It was awesome. Yeah. Um, the coolest part about it was how creative and, and kind of freeing it was. If you had an idea, um, you can go to another desk, you can go to a writer that you thought might be interested in it, you can pitch it to them. And then if they liked it, they could pitch it up their chain. And before you know it, you'd have, you know, the videographers, the photographers, the writers, and the editors all working on it. And you kind of create like a thing that just originated with an idea you had. That was always incredible. And it could be almost anything. Um, There was a whole week, two weeks, actually, we spent reviewing these replica lightsabers and we did a whole production where we fought with them (laughs) it annoyed everybody everybody was super mad (laughs) i saw that video when i was kind of like doing my prep for this interview and that was uh very cool (laughs) i showed it to my wife i was like i kind of want a lightsaber yeah that was that was fun i got to do that for work for two weeks so that's what wired was kind of all about It, it had that feel to it i wondered if it was as cool as it seemed it is. It was just, I was really attracted to working for Wired when I was in college. Um, I, I just started looking at their magazines and I loved the style. I liked the humor. And I was fortunate enough to get a job there right after school. And it, it's such a broad umbrella. Wired covers everything from like hard science to comic books. And I have a broad interest in all of those things. So if you're like a nerd, it's like a, a like, or like a geek, it's like a happy place to be. Like you're in good company there. And it's similar at NASA. Like you're in good company if you're in all that, all that stuff. You get a lot of geek humor both places, I would guess. Most definitely, yeah. Absolutely. Now, Nora, you pinged with me because you did your undergraduate at at Rochester, where all of my interns I I run an optical lab came from. Oh, yeah. I'm used to the optical engineering guys. You have a kind of different degree, and I'm curious about it because I see a lot of BFAs in photography, but yours is entirely different. Yeah. um, So I got a bachelor's of science in uh, imaging and photographic technology which uh, is sort of the more technical sides of photography. We're interested in how it works mm-hmm. and um, as well as, as scientific photography itself. So using photography for scientific purposes. I guess I'm, I'm more interested in, in the, the stuff that's behind the whys and the questions. And um, Yeah, that's, that's kind of cool. Uh, that, that's what I do. I, I'm, I'm all about the, I always describe myself, I'm the mechanic, not the race car driver, but. Uh, yeah. Was that an immediate interest, Nora? Did you come from an art background and then transition into more of a technology and science background? Or was it technology and science as a primary focus from the beginning? No, actually, I I did go to... um, So RIT is is an interesting school, Rochester Institute of Technology. 
uh, for photography because it is one of the only ones that has so many different photo degrees. You don't just get a degree in photography. There's a lot of different photo degrees. Um, and so I actually went first for photojournalism. That was what interests me. But I really quickly learned that I was I was missing a lot of the sciences and, and, and maths and the technical problem solving aspect really right away. And uh, so I started looking into more programs and I actually went to a panel of graduates from from RIT, all different photo de- programs. And one of them, uh, Paul Reichardt, uh, worked at NASA. Um, and he was, um, his degree was in imaging and photographic technology. And that was really the first time I ever even thought that that, you know, I could work for NASA. Uh, <laughs> And as it was, it was like, I just, I, I caught a bug and I became fixated and that was, that was what I wanted. Um, and so I switched my degree and became very focused and it was definitely more for me. Yeah. For, for a lot of our audience doesn't know, but, um, RIT and Arizona are probably the only two really optical schools in the country. And that is not an easy degree to get when you graduate from RIT. Yeah. So my degree is in the, um, in the photo department and not actually in the, the imaging science, uh, which is where the optical is. Uh, so it's a little bit different, but I did take some courses in, in the optical science program and it is definitely challenging. Yeah. It's a tough school. I spent about four years with 19 year old kids explaining things to me. I didn't understand. And, uh, <laughs> they're, they're pretty bright. Uh, Josh, your background, you, you, you have a, a little lengthier background, not just wired before you, uh, you came to NASA. You, did you start in the Navy? I did. Yeah. I didn't know what I wanted to do after high school. Uh, so I went to the Navy recruiting office that my friend went to. And uh, the Navy at the time was the only one that guaranteed jobs upon enlistment, meaning that like when I got out of boot camp, that job would be waiting for me. And I, I kind of chose photography almost at random from a big list of jobs that were available. Uh, and, you know, fortunate turn of events, I, I got in and I that's how I got my start. Um, all my training was after boot camp, they put you through a four month crash course of basic still photography, and then they throw you out into the fleet. And the rest of it is uh, on the job training. The community of photographers was really tight knit and really passionate. And I feel like they kind of raised me and, and gave me all that foundational knowledge to, to, to leave the Navy, go to school, and kind of like build my career from there. Wow. That sounds like some really like intensive training. Well, to, to the degree that I was once. I was on a deployment. This may have been my third deployment that they put me on a helicopter and I was probably like 21, 22. And I was in charge of taking pictures of the three boats that were part of our, uh, our unit. And I had to direct the boats from the helicopter. And so there was a guy with me talking to me and I'm like, Hey, I need the big boat to move this way and the little boat to move that way. And then he Wait would really Did you really them. say big boat and little boat in the Navy? Well, I, I was actually giving the names of the ships, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, generally speaking, right, like, you know, it was, it was a lot of responsibility. And uh, then, you know, a, a few moments later, you'd see the ships start moving kind of in the direction I wanted them to. So that it was unbelievable. The amount of um, kind of responsibility I had in, just in that moment, you know, that's gotta be the most awesome feeling of power. If I direct warships where to it go. was rad. Yeah. It was super cool. <laughs> did you have, much photography experience before that? Not at all. Um, I had a point and shoot camera that I would take to Eckerd's now and then to like have the film <laughs> developed, but that was the extent of it. Um, I always thought I'd be like a cartoonist, like my brother. Um, so I love to draw, but I was never anywhere near as talented as he was at it. So I just didn't feel like I can do it as a career, which is kind of why I went into the military and, uh, photography was what the moment I discovered it. Um, well, you know, when I tell the story, I say that like, you know, um, it was August 9th, 2005. And I remember the day because it's like a birthday for me. That was the day that they, they classed us up, uh, for our basic still photography course. And they kind of took us on a tour of the facilities and the different courses, uh, and classes we'd be taking. And they hand us, uh, you know, our first uh, camera an actual SLR. And in that moment I knew like, Oh, this is definitely my thing. I hadn't discovered it prior to then, but the moment I saw it, I was like, I'm going to do this my whole life. You do some cool things now. Um, Josh, you've gone up. You Part of your thing is you fly in uh, in jets, right? Yes, on occasion. Mm-hmm. I All I can think about is 
does it take a little time to not toss your cookies? Because I'm sure the pilots can't wait to get a rookie up there. You know, I was surprised that I never got sick. Um, the first time I went up was the, the that's like your checkout flight. That's when they are basically taking you up after you do your training to let you understand what the flight or what the aircraft is like, what it's like to pull G's, what it's like to be in that environment. And so they kind of like, you know, they do a lot of barrel rolls. They do a lot of loops. They, they try and make you understand what it's capable of and how it's going to make you feel uh, to an extreme. And I felt fine. It was just like riding a really awesome roller coaster. I kind of described it like, like riding a motorcycle in the sky, you know, because the canopy is just kind of wide open. I just really enjoyed it. I thought it was a blast. Nora, have you done that? I have not. I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there like a waiting list of people? <laughs> Yeah, we have uh, two photographers on our team that that do that. It would it would definitely be cool. I, I would like to be on the short list. <laughs> <laughs> and speak, how many photographers do you guys work with? I mean, it sounds like there's a pretty large team in various locations with NASA. We have a team of five here at JSC um, Johnson Space Center. But yes, there are photographers at every center. But but headquarters is Johnson, so. Probably just one or two at other places. Uh, well, Johnson is the center for human space flight, but uh, headquarters actually also has their own photographers. Well, I actually, uh, I did intern at two different NASA centers. Um, so I do have a little experience on what, what they do at different centers. Um, so I interned at, at Langley Research Center in Florida, and then I also interned at Ames Research Center out in California. Um, cool. And so they're both they're both research centers, so they do a lot more with with science. And uh, Ames Research Center has uh, wind tunnels. Uh, the, well, we have wind tunnels, but the largest wind tunnel. And so that's that's really cool. And I got to to work on a test in there and uh, do high speed video when I was out there. So that was very very cool. Oh, high speed video is cool. I'm curious about your internship experience. I, I imagine that must be a uh, pretty competitive field of candidates it, was it a photography specific internship is that kind of how you started in general or was it a different field um not exactly so my so the first internship i did was at langley um and the way uh it kind of worked there was uh at that time you, you just sort of apply for this it was uh lars langley aerospace research student scholars was the program and you kind of just apply for the program and then you put your preferences on where you would like to work and so i had just sort of listed a bunch of places a bunch of the different departments as my preferences because you know i didn't know exactly what any of them would have with my degree but i just thought i'm gonna try for everything you know so i'm just gonna whoever wants me um and i was i was contacted by the cultural resources department and basically my main role was doing a lot of archiving and scanning of, of old documents and um, images and things that they had that they were trying to digitize. Um, but I also got to do an interview with, um, reti- well, actually a couple interviews with like retired researchers um, and put together videos and products for them. But the big thing about it was really the networking because I met people through that that then got me my next internship. So you know, even though it wasn't particularly in the program that I wanted or in the place that I wanted to do, um, I was able to make those connections, um, which then got me uh, connected to my mentor at uh, Ames Research Center. And he worked in the fluid mechanics laboratory and he was a technical photographer. And so I was able to that following summer work with him. Um, he basically just sent me the application and was like, hey, here's how you apply. Um, but you know, we had talked and we had communications, he had seen my resume. And so he was like, you have to apply this way, but like, you got it. (laughs) Um, that's a good feeling. Yeah, Yeah. definitely. So, um, I applied for that one and that was, um, I had my main project there was to work on, um, it was definitely more scientific. I was working in the fluid mechanics laboratory and we were trying to image like flow as it goes over, uh, spacecraft. So there's various techniques for that. Mm -hmm. Um, Not spacecrafts, uh, mostly actually just like airplanes. Flying things. Yes, flying things. Um, So uh, 
anyways, my main project there was was very technical and scientific. Uh, it involved lasers and things um, in, in to use to image to use a very special technique to image this stuff. Um, but I got to you know, like I said, work also and do high speed video. And one of the really cool things I got to do was they were doing. I think it was uh, ESA, the European Space Agency, was doing a test in the the full scale wind tunnel out there of a uh, Mars landing parachute that they were testing on. And we set up high speed cameras and I got to be a part of that test. And there was a day that my mentor wasn't there and he left me in charge. Um, oh, so, that's cool. you know, I was this intern and I was working with all these researchers from uh, the European Space Agency as these French researchers. And I got to work with them and, and I was their go to for imaging. So that was really cool. You know, they were all like I, it was my responsibility to make sure everything worked. And it did. So. <laughs> it, did you. Uh, I guess this is for both of you. Did you have to go through any like NASA specific training? I mean, I guess the internship is pretty much that, but was there any specific training process before you started your position you have now? Just an over the phone interview. <laughs> really? Yeah. So the process for, uh, I would say when we started, uh, the first week is kind of a lot of, uh, online trainings and things like that, that you just have to get done. Um, so we did have to do a lot of that stuff, but they definitely, they threw us in pretty, pretty quickly um, into shooting and actually getting out and, and doing things. Really that whole first year, you're learning how things operate at NASA and it, the job has so many different requirements. And like we said, hats to wear that it, it takes a long time to kind of, you know, get your stride. And I don't think you ever really, I mean, <laughs> we're still constantly, you know, you can get to a shoot that we've never done before oh, or no yeah. one's ever done before and yeah. there's still new things to learn i was thinking that things things probably change as quickly as you learn them yeah yeah <laughs> right yeah it sounds unbelievably challenging to have kind of that mix between i don't know like one day you're almost doing like a corporate portrait headshot situation and then you know the next day it could be a very technically challenging like you said fluid dynamics photography and high speed video it sounds like you're just constantly solving problems which seems like a dream job for a certain type of brain yeah uh i think that that's exactly why i like it um, i don't i don't think i would like to do the same thing every day um for me that's what keeps it interesting what, what about changing equipment because you know as a, as a, it was a rental place we're constantly trying to keep up what's the newest what's the best do you guys get a big flow of equipment or do you tend to stay with old faithful until somebody takes it out of your hands <laughs> um we, we're right now we're using nikon d5s um and that's been the kit uh our like our our day-to-day -day kit um since i've been here since we arrived we actually got hired on the same day um, so I think that there are set intervals when gear is refreshed, um, but I, I'm not really sure when those are or how that's factored in. Uh, what have you broken? <laughs> <laughs> I have not broken anything yet. <laughs> really? Yes. Oh, Josh. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Nora? <laughs> uh. I would um, consider this a badge of honor, by the way, not something to be good. Yeah, about. Most definitely, yeah, yeah, I feel like if you're getting in there, you got to break some stuff eventually. I, I did drop a Sony video camera one time. Um, yeah, that was that was not my best moment. Um, <laughs> but also, I think the one <laughs> I think the one that Josh is referring to here is uh, we Josh was with me. We were on a shoot um, and we were doing. So there's a the Orion uh, spacesuit that they're working on for the, the mm -hmm. for the Orion vehicle. Um, they wanted to sort of test mobility, and it was during the uh, World Series of the, the baseball World Series, and so we took it out to the baseball fields, and basically they wanted to hit around the baseball and just see how the suit moves and, and sort of prove that they could do that um, in the suit and that it was it was worked for that um and so we went out with lights and equipment to make it this whole setup and um the guy in the suit was hitting the baseball yeah he was hitting them for sure <laughs> he was really hitting the baseball yeah. and um he hit one directly into one of our light bulbs oh that's awesome 
yeah. completely shattered the ball. But, I've seen uh, those. I've seen those images of the guy that's hitting the baseball. But I got the shot. There you go. Yeah, the yeah that's the important thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I saw those too. Uh, and yeah, fully worth it. Fully yeah. worth a broken light. Those are really, really cool pictures. They're very surreal. It looks like everybody's having a good time. It's like baseball on Mars or something. It's really yeah. Cool. yeah. And honestly, I mean, that's that's one of those fun things about our job is it can be so we can have such random shoots because that shoot actually came in the day we did it. It was like they they were like, the weather's good. We want to do this. Um, and yeah, that just happened. And we're like, hey, can we do this? <laughs> hey, y'all, um, I got an idea. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. basically. Uh, so that just shows how, how vastly different every day in our job can be. <laughs> we are into broken equipment because we have so much break. So that's kind of cool for us. But it's uh, almost always a good story behind it. We'll take a quick break and be back with more from Nora Moran and Josh Valkersell. If you only know lens rentals from our yelling about cameras on the internet, there's more to the story. We're actually the largest online videography and photography equipment rental house in the entire world. Cameras, lenses, lights, audio, drones, just about anything. Here's how it works. Just go to lensrentals.com and tell us what you need and when you need it. We ship it straight to you in protective cases. You use it for whatever your heart desires, then ship it back to us with the included return label. Next time you need equipment for a shoot, head to lensrentals.com slash podcast for a discount on your order. That's lensrentals.com slash podcast. Welcome back to the Lens Rentals Podcast. Uh, we're talking with Nora Moran and Josh Valkersell from NASA's photography team. Do you either of you have a favorite assignment you've shot so far for NASA? Uh, yeah, most definitely. Um, my favorite, personally, and it's more like a nostalgic favorite, was uh, I kind of started, well, we started when the new class of astronauts, the Turtles, uh, began their careers too. And one of the first things they do as a group is have uh, wilderness survival training in Maine. And I got to go with them and spend a week kind of camping and getting to know them. And it was just kind of amazing to be in that position. And I felt like, you know, I got to kind of share in their initiation at NASA as astronauts and kind of in the, in the community and the culture. Uh, my favorite is also very similar. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, thing. I got to go on a week long geology training uh, with, with the same class of astronauts um, where we camped in New Mexico. And so I was, I was just very much immersed in, in their training and it was really cool to just get to know them all and to see it and to, and to camp in New Mexico under the beautiful stars. And, uh, I took a lot of astrophotography of the stars and, um, did like star trails and things. And so that was definitely one of my favorite experiences. It helps that they're all great people too. They're just really fun to be around. Yeah. So they're, and, uh, they're accepting of you then sounds like. Very much. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and my training had, a uh, uh, astronaut Don Pettit came as well. Um, and, uh, he, while he was on station, he's done a lot of star trails from station. And so it was really cool to talk with him while we both shot star trails from earth. Um, uh, so that was a really fun experience. Uh, <laughs> that is cool. But that, that kind of nice segue into a question I had, do you guys train the astronauts in photography any? We do not, but there is a group here that does that. That's actually what Paul Riker, the one who uh, I saw, I the one who encouraged me to to switch my program, my major in school. Um, that's actually where he works. Uh, so he does train the astronauts on that. Both of you have been doing this for for a few years, anyway. I've I've read there's some photographers that have been there forever. Is this a lifelong career for most people who who go to NASA? Yeah, definitely. Um, 20 to 30 years is, besides ourselves, that's the norm. It, it seems like it would be kind of like, after this, what do you do next? I can't think of anything that would be that cool. It's, it's hard to imagine, uh, like, what would come after something like this job specifically at NASA. And, and not only because of how cool the job is in terms of what we get to shoot and kind of the changing environment, but also the community that we're in. It's just a great work environment in general. Um, having worked in a lot of different places, uh, you know, everyone here is really mission oriented. Um, everybody communicates really well. It, it's just, you know, safety conscious. It, it's just the kinds of people you'd want to work with, uh, which I really appreciate. 
the the NASA community is definitely, um, you know, I said I caught the NASA bug early um, when I, you know, did my internships and things. That's that's definitely the thing that appealed to me most was just it's just such a good place to to be, um, and everybody is is awesome, and you get to see all of the science and all of the things we that's going on, and it's it's just very inspiring. And it's also really like you know NASA is kind of an altruistic thing, right? So it's it's a good thing, and it's amazing to get behind that. And everyone here really loves NASA and really loves the mission and what we're doing. And so it's just great that every day it can be the most mundane thing. It's contributing to a kind of this uh, this concept of a greater good, you know, this greater goal. Um, mm-hmm. And I, there's just not a whole lot of jobs I can imagine in the world that can provide you that sense of satisfaction in that way. Yeah, someone who's been at a lot of different jobs. There, there's a when you work at a place where everybody is enthusiastic, it's you absorb that. It's like you go get energy at work. Oh yeah, yeah. It's kind of a, a longstanding tradition too. Since the beginning of the space program, it's always been a priority to document it, and not only in a scientific way, but in a popular cultural way. Uh, I'm wondering why you think it's important to uh, document this stuff in a way that it is accessible to everyone. I think NASA is is another amazing place to work because it is so inspiring for everybody. Um, you know, space exploration is something that's just inherently intriguing to humans, you know, I mean, exploration in general. Um, and so we just, we have this, this responsibility, I think, to, to share what we are doing with everyone, just to inspire and to, to push forward and to encourage younger generations to get into STEM fields and to push the limits of things, which is what NASA does. We push the limits to extend farther into, into space and, and what we think is possible. And I, I think that's extremely important. And I think we play a very crucial role in that and taking imagery of what we're doing here. Yeah, you answered that question, thank you, in a way that clarified <laughs> what I meant by asking it. I couldn't really put it into words. But yeah, what I'm, well, I guess what I'm getting to is it, it's not important just to do the work. It's important to show the work being done and sort of act as an inspiration. Absolutely. Um, Josh actually has a nice uh, way that he <laughs> describes this as us living in history. Uh, so I'm going to let Josh oh, expand on that. Well, I think I know what you mean. Um, uh, one of the coolest ways I heard it described, I think it's in Mike Massimino's book, um, that to see people doing the things that we're doing at NASA, to see them going into space, it just makes you feel awesome about being human. And I think that's really the core of it, right? And, and that's what I think we get to do. That's kind of what we're responsible for is, is is trying to present that image to the rest of the world. But I do kind of have like an overarching way of looking at the job. And I like to imagine myself as a time traveler from the future and I'm visiting the past and I'm documenting history. And it's I, I kind of keep that perspective as a way to always remember that that's really what I'm doing on every, every day. Every moment is an opportunity to document history. And it's just kind of a way to, to give it that kind of import, that weight um, without losing sight of it. That's a very cool perspective. I like that. Yeah. And, and right now, for instance, you know, we have all this stuff going on with, with crew one, um, which is going to be the first official crew to, to launch on the SpaceX Dragon vehicle to the station. Um, and it's, it's really awesome because, you know, Josh and I both have, have seen them train, have, have been doing all these, these photographs of their training. Um, I got to take their, their crew portraits, which was awesome. Um, so we were right in the middle of this historic event. Um, and that's, that's just awesome. I don't really know how. Yeah, to it's, it's, it's incredible. In the literal sense of the word. It yeah. Really yeah. 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 I'm going to throw out a, a perspective for you from uh, my side answering Ryan's question because with COVID, I've spent the last year teaching science to my nine and seven year old granddaughters every afternoon. And to see them light up when I can take them to a NASA site, and we're doing astronomy right now, and show them pictures. And here are the people who went up in space. Uh, one of my granddaughters saw just a close up. I don't even remember which astronaut it was. And she was looking at it for like five minutes going, that man went into space, right? And it just fascinated her that she was seeing up close uh, the face of an astronaut. 
So I think that's a it's a huge motivator you guys do, and I'm watching it motivate my two kid my two grandkids. Which is I cool. feel like we have that sentiment every time we were in the room with one of the astronauts. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, the same feeling. Yeah. These people went to space. This is amazing. I don't know. I actually feel, I mean, we definitely have that, but sometimes I do feel like that fades because the really cool thing about them is they're also all people and they're Very really true. awesome people. Um, and so sometimes when you're talking with them, you could, it's easy to just forget how incredible they are because they are also just really nice and friendly people. Um, yeah, they're very humble. Yeah. And very humble. Um, in my experience. <laughs> <laughs> That has to be a pre-qualification, right? You can't <laughs> you can't send an annoying Certainly person to space. Right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. I think that's the best part about it. You know that that saying that like you know you, you know you should you shouldn't meet your heroes. I, I think it doesn't apply with astronauts. I think like they, they exceed your expectations and just the way they are. They're what you'd hope they'd be. Do you have any advice for younger photographers interested in working in scientific photography in general? I think that science photography as a subset of just photography at large is, I don't think there's as much competition for it. So I think if you have an interest in science, don't be afraid to make that, to make that your photographic subject of choice. Um, you know, use photography as a, as a means to learn about those things and uh, kind of reveal those subjects in whatever way you, you happen to in, uh, engage them with. I, I, the best advice I got was at a workshop. Um, I had gotten interested in photographing, uh, architecture relating to green energy and, and power. I just kind of became fascinated with that subject. And I did a lot of aerial photography and I took a bunch of these different pictures and I, I had a portfolio review and that's what the editor recommended to me. She's like, you know, if you have an interest in this stuff, um, you should consider pursuing that. It, it's not as competitive as say maybe fashion photography or, or um, photojournalism. You know, there's a lot of people really gunning for those positions, for those jobs, for those opportunities. But Science, if it attracts you, go for it. Um, it's very rewarding. And the subjects are super cool. And if you're passionate about what you're photographing, that'll show through in your photographs. You know, if you're taking pictures of things that don't interest you, then that's just not going to, you know, it's not going to excite you. And it's probably not going to excite your viewers. But if you love what you're doing and what you're shooting, then then you have interest and, and that comes through. But I actually, so my biggest advice to young people in general um who are trying to start their careers or just you know trying to figure out what they want to do it's just just shoot for every shot you can um like i said about my internship you know that first one that i had wasn't necessarily exactly what i wanted but it got me where i am you know just try and apply for everything and if you think you're not qualified apply anyway shoot for everything you want to like try it you know see you never know where it might take you that's good advice for anything yeah, and embrace failure. That's like the, the, you know, what science is based on, right? So like make it a part of your life. Just embrace it. Learn from it. Uh, it's all an opportunity to just get better. Embrace critique. I think that's like the greatest strength you can have all through your life and certainly as a photographer. It also seems like, and this is probably a, a common thread between science and photography as an art, uh, is that I looked through both of your portfolios for a while before we started this. And uh you know, I've seen great photographers' portfolios that are just thousands of photographs that look exactly the same. Like, I am a uh, landscape photographer, and this is what I do. And both of your portfolios are extremely eclectic. It, it seems like you're both learning constantly and changing constantly. Um, I'm, I'm curious, what do you think was the most recent like new skill you've had to learn? Because it seems like you're both learning all the time. For me, the most dramatic one I may have ever had to learn is, um, uh, I think last year I was, I was put on as one of the photographers that goes out uh, to Yuma and do, we do the parachute drop testing out there. And so it requires shooting with like an 800 millimeter lens from anywhere from six to 10,000 feet in a helicopter of uh, you know a mock space capsule being dropped out of a plane and you're trying to capture the entire sequence of the parachute on reefing, uh, the, the different Whoa. stages of the chute. And it was so challenging. Everyone told me the, the hardest part of all of it, like once you see it and you can get it in your lens, it's fine. The hardest part is just seeing it with your naked eye out in the sky. And everyone told me this is going to be really hard for you to see. There's even somebody sitting next to you spotting it out and pointing. And it's still difficult to see. And Going into it, I was like, okay, I know it's going to be small. Just, you know, try to look at where they're pointing and, and acquire the target. And it was way stranger than that because 
when I finally saw it, like the moment, like I, my focus shifted a little bit, it just disappeared completely. And so you're looking out at this desert of just like, you know, just earth and sky. And I think it's almost like a mental game where your mind thinks that that little dot is insignificant information. And so it's just not <laughs> revealing mm. to you, almost like a magic eye poster. You know what I mean? So like, I almost had to like think differently in order to see it. So I don't even know how to really describe what that process is like, other than it's almost like you have to look with peripheral vision to notice it. And then you have to drop, you have to kind of line up your lens in such a way where depending on how far away you are, the, the, the capsule is, is maybe just above your lens. And then I drop my eye into the viewfinder and hopefully catch it in there. And then you just try and keep with it the entire way. And you're hoping that the autofocus is going to work because if it racks out suddenly, you have to reacquire it all over again. And, you know, you're trying to get the entire sequence, so you don't want any of that stuff to happen. It's very challenging. Uh, for, for your personal photography, what's the most fun for you to shoot outside of NASA? When you're, what, what do you take pictures of when you're wandering around with your camera? I, I actually don't do a lot of personal photography. And I, it's because I'm, I'm pretty introverted. Um, I have to turn on a switch in order to be productive as a photographer, and it requires me to be extroverted. And so... It actually requires me a ton of energy from me to do it in a motivated way. Um, and so you almost never see me shooting outside of work. But if I do have a project, if I do have an idea um, at home, I turn the switch on and I'm just as motivated. It just it has to be a really specific thing I'm going after. Uh, Nora, on that same kind of subject, I, I know you still do quite a bit of like photojournalism style uh, work. I saw that in your portfolio, shooting at protests and things like that. How has your work at NASA, you think, informed uh, that more maybe traditional photojournalism work? Yeah, I do. I did a little of that that was really just for myself. Um, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't shooting for any, any magazines or any, you know, newspapers or anything like that. I just bought my camera and wanted to see what I could capture. So, you know, the, but I would definitely say that um, I've learned a lot at NASA about how to shoot events and shoot uh, things and just always, you know, you know what to look for. Um, but uh, the thing that I probably do the most on the side, um, you know, I'm going to show my nerd cards here. Um, <laughs> if you hadn't brought it up, I it was next on my list of questions. <laughs> Is that the, um, which if you've seen my website, you you saw the cosplay photo section. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I, I I do cosplay on my myself personally as well. Uh, I do cosplays, but I also, you know, I have a lot of friends in the community, so I do a lot of photos. And that I love to do because it's it's a very different type of, of photography, I feel like, because um, I try to recreate the feel of whatever the, the subject is from. So I spend a lot of time like looking at reference images and trying to figure out how to light something and and, and make it have that same look and feel as the, the source material. I just want to say, I, I saw those and they were fun. I think you captured the fun of it. and that, that Yeah, they're very, very cool. They are really good. Do you see how they tiptoed into that subject, Nora? They, they were leading <laughs> the they were like five, five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in that direction. So, so, you, sometimes you, you, you want to background the people you're talking to, but you don't want to feel like a stalker. And it's right. a fine yeah. line. Yeah. It's yeah. a fine line, yeah. Yeah. And I think, I don't know, like I said earlier, it's, it's, it's inspiring to see that both of you are still kind of curious and learning and trying new things. Like I know I, I don't shoot nearly as much on the weekends as I should, and I don't have a job. I'm sure that's nearly as grueling as your work. It, it seems like it's very fun, but it also seems like it's probably very time consuming and difficult at times. And it's, uh, it's cool that you're still inspired by photography for side projects like that. You know what I, I choose to do instead of shooting a lot is um, I engage in all my other nerdy hobbies. Like I play a lot of video games. Um, I read comic books, um, watch a lot of movies, like things everybody does. Mm -hmm. But I read a book uh, in college called Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud. Oh, yeah. I had to read that in college. It was great. That book is amazing. It's just about visual communication and it compares um, like hieroglyphs to, to comic books and sequential art in general. Everything's kind of in a frame. It's storyboarding. If you look at movies, if you watch video games, they're all filled with characterization, frames, imagery. So all those things that I engage in that have 
on a surface, nothing to do with photography, have everything to do with it because it's all visual storytelling. And if you have a mind for it, you can kind of absorb it subconsciously. And I really feel like all those things contribute to my subliminal aesthetic as a photographer, which is really what separates us in the end, right? Like that's what makes you you. That's what gives you your perspective. Right. That's a great recommendation for any like beginner photographers who are listening to this. That's a book that probably isn't going to show up on your like top 10 photography books to read, but it's really important for understanding uh, composition and sequence and just mood. It's yeah, that would be a really great one for any photographer to read. I'm going to go ahead and get it because I have not read it. So I'm excited. That's one of my favorite books. It, it was very empowering and just kind of gave me a license to just value did to not really feel like anything I was doing in particular was a waste of time. You know, like it's all a form of research if you have a certain mindset. Uh, do either of you have any upcoming projects you're excited about? I don't know. I mean, I don't know if Josh has anything he knows about already, but the way it kind of works for us is a lot of times, you know, uh, we don't really do the assigning. Um, we just sort of get give, given assignments um, and that's what we're doing. And uh, sometimes a lot of the times, like I was talking about, the baseball one came in that day. Um, a lot of times there isn't really a whole lot of uh, knowing in advance what we're doing. Um, things kind of just get thrown at us um, and we got to we got to work with it, um, which is which is fun. So I, I don't have anything that I know of <laughs> coming up. Um, I don't know if Josh does. I know next year I have more drop tests and I, I'm kind of a part of these tests. I'm, I'm supplementing the prime photographer on these. I'm adding more visuals, but really it's an opportunity for me to train um, because I'll be, as far as I know, I'm slotted to be one of the photographers to capture Orion, uh, the unmanned Orion when it goes around the moon and returns. So I'm supposed to be there taking pictures of it, coming back through the atmosphere and, and, and splash landing. So this is kind of what that's gearing me up for. No, that's, that's pretty cool. Nora, Josh, thank you so much for joining us. That was really, really cool. Uh, yeah, thank you again for your time. That's all I've got is thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, right on. Thanks for listening to the Linternals podcast. You can find Josh and Nora's work throughout NASA's blog and image galleries at nasa.gov, as well as on their personal websites, joshvalphoto.com and noramoranphoto.com. We'll link to those and a ton of other reference material in the show notes, so be sure to check that out. For my part, I'm going to take Josh and Nora's advice and try something new this weekend. Maybe shoot some style or subject I've never tried before. Might not go well, but an ambitious failure is better than a boring success. If you venture out of your photographic comfort zone, let us know by tagging at LensRunnels on Instagram. We would love to see what you're learning. The Lens Rentals podcast is a production of LensRentals.com. If you've got a question or topic you'd like covered on the show, email us at podcast at LensRentals.com or leave us a voicemail at 901-609-LENS. That's 901-609-LENS. If you're enjoying the show, please review us on iTunes and subscribe in your podcast app of choice. Make sure to check the show notes for a link to this week's coupon code. And as always, Roger Sokala will leave you with an inspirational quote. You can't depend on your eyes when your imagination is out of focus. Mark Twain.